Hey, welcome to the Rude Dog Show. This is Rudy Reyes. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Facebook Live. You can download the app from Google or, well, iTunes as well. Good afternoon. I wish I had an intro song. My audio is just not being very cooperative today, so I apologize. Not, not having an opening tune, of course, my favorite, Sirius. Uh, but you know what? It, it's time to get serious. We're 50 days towards the NFL draft, guys. This is a free agent frenzy going on right now. Bills bring back their kicker. And a lot of transactions going on. Brendan LaFell returns to the Cincinnati Bengals as their tight end. I don't know how much money they gave up for that guy, but hopefully he'll be a lot more productive. Of course, can't receive balls from a guy who can't get, well, out of the pocket or be able to throw the ball uh, when he needs to. And I am talking, well, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Redhead guy Andy Dalton, under center for the Cincinnati Bengals. Look, welcome this afternoon. We have... Kind of a, a, a closing pattern because the NFL draft is upon us. Combines across the country are also uh, being a part of closing as well. And look, you, I know what you may be thinking. Today is no different except for the two guests I have on my show today. Okay, no, it is a little bit different. We're going to mix it up in the last 15 minutes of the show. But look, standout players, one can argue, could be associated with the top shelf schools in Division One football and could be right in in the thick of things, when you're talking about how you look around and realize that you're the last one to leave, uh, you would probably pick a chosen your know, chosen few amount of players at a time. Uh, they're out there, and I'm talking about players that are out there who have a story. These guys just don't either have an opportunity, don't have a podium to stand on, and or maybe have disposed of the soapbox they were otherwise standing on before, <laughs> having a real conversation in regards to where they're headed. Look, uh, you have to be able to see, as a coach, where people are, where people lie, where people exist, where they can actually be of a benefit to you and not be of a negative to you. So when you look at those types of things, you can look at scouts and coaches, maybe being a negative, maybe being a positive, but a lot of small Division One A schools, Division II schools, uh, NAIA, and, include, and you can probably add uh, JUCO onto that as well in relation to you know these schools are not being visited by these coaches or scouts. Why? Because they believe that all the talent is at the Division One level. I'm here to tell you that is not the case. And my next guest can certainly contest to that. Uh, and look, you can always go for the low-hanging fruit, and that's fine. You may not be able to see much unless you visit those other small Division One and or Division Two schools. And look, my theory is this. Division Two players' lives matter. So don't make any mistake about that. Uh, you know, look, we're headed to the next level, and we learn a lot at the professional level, especially when we're talking about players who are trying to get to that next level, who are chomping at the bit, working extremely hard, who are very durable because of the adversities they faced in their life. And when I when I think of a player, I think to myself, you know, this guy is in a make-or-break situation. How is he going to rise to the occasion? You know, the, the cream of the crop rise to the top, and that's exactly where my next guest is right now. So as far as being a high-risk, high-reward player who's found himself looking forward and never looking back, welcome my first guest on the show today, Marquel Beckwith, running back out of the Southwestern Athletic Conference, Whew, or SWAC for short, as some people probably want to recognize that, who's been through life and a journey and what he's doing right now to make his next move count on an NFL roster. Hey, Mark, well, thanks for taking your time out to join me on the show today. I appreciate it. Hey, what's up, Rudy? How you doing? I'm doing great, man. How are you? I'm doing well, man. Just finished up some training for today. Just headed in into the house right now. I'm about to chill and relax before I get out of that app. Out of Atlanta tomorrow. Okay. We're doing good, though. Okay, so you're headed out to uh, from Atlanta to a, a, a combine, or where are you headed to? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to head home tomorrow, back home to Montgomery, Alabama. And um, Thursday night, tomorrow night, we're going to head down to New Orleans and check into the hotel. I have the regional combine in New Orleans um, Friday and Saturday. Oh, boy. I bet, I bet you're excited to go. Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm. I'm very excited. You know, been training, training for it, um, pro day in the combine since December the twenty eighth. Just go, just ready to go out there and just show these scouts what I got, and show these scouts that I can play, which I know I can. Oh yeah, no, I I believe you can play. You are what you call a 
a baller, somebody who certainly knows what it takes to get to the next level, and you'll have all your weaponry associated when you get on the field in front of scouts and coaches across the NFL. Look, let's start from the very beginning. You were raised in Montgomery, Alabama, with your mom, with your mom Wanda. Stepfather was Arthur, and despite not having your biological father a part of your everyday life, you had your older brothers, and at, at times your your sister. They, they all seem to play an, an integral part of your life and where you're headed. When you look at uh, when you look at your your two little boys, and they're so cute. I seen I seen a photo of them. Liddell and Latrell. Latrell's five, and Liddell is six years old. Look, those guys know how to keep you rolling as well. If, if it's not two days on the field, you seem to find two days with you when you have two kids <laughs> on a daily hey, basis. Man. You do, man. <laughs> yeah, they keep me going. They keep me going. There's a lot of motivation coming from them in my entire family, really. Well, that's and that's really what it's about. If your kids can keep you going, keep it rolling, that's your inspiration to keep under, letting people understand who you are, what you're about. Not only from a player's standpoint, you can put up the numbers, you can put up the touchdowns, uh, you know, you can get uh, yards from from behind the backfield. You can have all those wonderful things, but if you don't have the passion and the drive to not only be the best father you can be from a, from a from being a, a father and a man standpoint. Then your character doesn't mean much because you're not you won't be able to put that on display this coming weekend uh, for the New Orleans Combine. All right, all right, you're right about that. So, not to mention, as in, uh, probably anybody knows, and if you don't know, you should know. You just turned 23 in February, so happy belated birthday to you! Well, thanks, man. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I, I, I spent. I spent I, I spent that birthday training. <laughs> <laughs> you did so, so. So did you cut out early, or was it, you know, was it something you just did a two a day on, or was it just a one a day? You spent the other two on your birthday, or how did you how did you manage that? It, it was a, it was just a normal day, like a normal training day. Like it was it was my break, it was my birthday. I woke up, I thank God for it. Went to training like a normal day, like I've been doing for the last ten weeks. Well, those are hard 10 weeks, but certainly you will be, again, on display for everybody to see, everybody to witness, and really enjoy having you there at the New Orleans Combine. Look, let's start at the very beginning. Uh, let, let's look at the beginning of life in Montgomery, Alabama. Three other siblings in a household. I also have you know, three siblings, and, and I, I understand what it's like to, to have an older sibling, but you had two older brothers, very different dynamic than, than I had growing up. But when you look at how they helped shape your life growing up, having two older brothers, uh, do you think of sibling rivalries? And was there one between you and your brothers, or just one and another brother? Or how did that work out? Um, the sibling rivalry, um, I say my brother, who close to me, I'm 23, he's 25. So growing up, like me and him, like we always competed. With football, you know, we all always competed. Um, basketball, um, racing, playing, playing the video games. Like it's always, like we always went back and forth with everything. And he pretty much led me down the right, the right track because he he wasn't, you know, like not taking nothing away from him. He he's a very changed person right now. But um, growing up, probably like the age of sixteen and seventeen, like um, the city of Montgomery. You know, like he ended up falling down on the wayside. Um, he ended up joining a gang, and he ended up um, dropping out of school. And he, you know, like that was just something that I didn't want to do. Like he made my mom cry, and you know, like I told I told myself at a very young age when I was nine, ten, eleven, twelve years old, I was like, I want to make my mom cry. You know, from doing something good, not dropping out of school, not you know, getting locked up and doing little stuff like that. So he was, uh, he, you know, he motivated me in a good way from his bad decisions. And that, that's, that's why I turned out the way I am right now from watching his mistakes and learning from his mistakes. I, I haven't had to make those mistakes because I watch him make them for me. Well, you know, we can always look back at our environment and say, this is what happened to me when I was growing up. I mean, I, I personally had a real tough, 
uh, real tough environment that I lived in, I, I recognize that there there is something greater. And, and to understand that there are people that are going to be around you, they're going to offer you things that aren't good for your body, that aren't good for your mind and or both. And it, it was the examples that were set before me, much like yourself, where you decided at a very early age, like I did, that that's not the way you want to go. It's just not the way you want to go. When you, exactly. When you started out, on this journey, there must have been some type of end all that you had in mind. Everybody, everybody starts a journey in order to end up somewhere. And clearly, sometimes those lines are skewed and we can always ask ourselves, well, how do we get to this point? You know, where are we at right now? What are we going to do to better ourselves, to better our situation in order to do something and see the light at the end of the tunnel? Let's start out at Robert Ely High School, but not only in a running back perspective, but you were a, a utility guy. It was more than just your running that they had seen. They seen your versatility on, on punt returns uh, and just being the, the kind of overall player that they're looking for. Not only from not only from an athletic standpoint. You, like I said, you can have all the numbers and everything, but when you talk about versatility, the types of things that you did at Robert Ely High School, you were part of the return game as well. And I'm sure that that the coaches, beyond what I had witnessed as well, certainly seen that you had potential. <laughs> Uh, and, and, but, but more importantly than that, you also recognize you had potential because they had put you in position to understand that there was so much more to your game than just running the football. Exactly. When, uh, you can go ahead. No, go ahead and answer. That's fine. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, um, yeah, starting off in high school at Robert E. Lee, um, I went there in the 10th grade, um, Went there, and I didn't play, like, the first six games. And, you know, like, coming from junior high school, I'm like, dang, like, I want to play. Like, the first in high school, like, dang, I want to play, I want to play, I want to play. So, one um, one day they put me, one, one game they put me in, I think it was the last four games, they put me in the game, and um, I had caught a seam out of the slot. They, they didn't put me in running back. They put me in, in the slot. And the offense that we ran, the running back play, running back and the running back also play slot receiver. So they put me in the slot, and um, I caught a steam route. It was fine. Right, I caught it down the field like 18 yards, and I ended up um, breaking for like 34, probably like 36 yards. And um, it was in week seven of my sophomore career. So ever since then, when I caught that pass, I started those last four games. And then the next year, my junior year, I started my junior year, and I also started my senior year. So I went on and um, I had a pretty good career at Robert E. Lee. Um, I went on my senior class. We had like 22, 22, 23 people on the football team with my senior class. And I was the only person to go on to college and um, continue my football career. Like we had people to go to the military, had people to go on to college, and we just had people to just go, go on and get jobs and everything. But I was the only person out of that senior class at my high school to go on and um, sign a scholarship and go on to play football. And that was a major blessing to me, to my mom, to my entire family. And I feel like that says a lot about the type of athlete I was then. Well, the athlete that you were then isn't necessarily the athlete that you are now. Everything has an evolutionary process. You understand where you've been, and you're you're making you're making steps, leaps and bounds, not only from being able to be a, a dad at a very young age, uh, but but to recognize that what you have to do are the steps before you, and it's going to take commitment, it's going to take passion, it's going to take grind for you to get to where you want to be. But when you attended Troy University, it wasn't exactly the greatest. Thing initially, I mean, when it when when you when you landed there, there was a personal note attached to the grand scheme of things. Overall, it wasn't the end all. Being there was not where where you ultimately were going to be, where you seen yourself headed to. As a matter of fact, you could you could see the tunnel you were headed towards, and seemingly the end was in sight, but still a little foggy because you were you're not quite where you wanted to be. So you become more recognizable as a versatile player because of what your sco your coaching staff had witnessed while you were at Troy. Had it ever occurred to you that maybe one position would have been your mainstay heading into college, or do you think that the running back position was something that you idealistically wanted to fulfill and become your whole position? Yeah, running back. Running back, um, I stuck with a running back position all through college. Um, I was just... You know, I grew up watching a lot of running backs, even the old school running backs. And coming up, um, I, I wore 28 from the 10th grade. Um, I 
was a big fan of Adrian Peterson. I just love how hard he ran. But I didn't try to model my game after him because Adrian Peterson, Adrian Peterson, I'm me. Um, he's bigger, you know, um, he's about 6'1", 6'2", 215, 220. And back then, I was like 5'8", 5'9", 160, you know. And um, being a running back was always my dream, you know, worked so hard for it. And um, I also have a good running back body. Like, I, I can play slot receiver if it comes down to it. If an NFL team tells me that they want to see me play strictly slot receiver, I can do that. I can do that because, like, I am a versatile player, and I can do that. But running back has always been my first love from, you know, when I started playing football at six. Like, they put me at running back. Um, my little league coach put me at running back and, yeah, I, you know, you play so many positions when you were, when, when you were, um, when you play little league football, but running back was always my thing. Well, running back can be something that you really look towards and say, you know, uh, th this is kind of where I'm at. This is what I'm hoping to have. This is what I hope at being a part of, of, of where my game ultimately lies. But then, you know, there are other expectations. Everybody has expectations. Everybody thinks that, that when you put uh, negative expectations or, or you or you heavily apply it to somebody's shoulders, that it's something that were almost non-existent because some are, you know, in all fairness, those real those expectations can be high. Did you feel as though other people had higher expectations for you? And if so, did you feel that the ones that you had set for yourself were more realistic? When you look at the, the the types of things that that people look at from you in a in a personal perspective, you think to yourself, man, you know, I can only do so much. Where other people really weighing in on you and saying, are you going to make it? Because we're because we're relying on you. They're giving you the word go to say, well, this is where we want you to be. Do you think that it was something that people had laid upon you unnecessarily? Um. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can say that, you know, some of my friends, just general conversation, like, man, you got to make it so we can do this. Uh, man, you got to make it so we can be like that. You know, like, I wouldn't say that it's pressure because I I have two kids, and I want to make it for them, first of all. And I have a mom who worked so hard for me, and so now I'm just trying to work hard for her so she can retire. So she won't have to be worried about going back to her job, like, but yes, I, I do have those people who, you know, try to put that pressure on me from just general conversations, so, yeah, I, I can, I say yes, I say yes. Well, you know, it's all about, you know, it, it, it's family first, it's your kids first, because they're the ones that are going to see you move on. Someone that may see you get to the point, look, the reality of it is, is that once you make it into the NFL, and I really believe that you will, that you're going to have people that are going to come after and say, you know, they're going to give you the old, oh, Polish, please. You're going to have their hands out at your door. <laughs> they're going to wonder, well, where's my hand out? They're going to say, well, where were you all of a sudden? You want to show up out of nowhere and ask me for things that could ultimately end to me being broke when you haven't been there for me at all in any capacity whatsoever. And those types of people are the ones that you close the door on and say thanks but no thanks. That is the reality of it. That's the bottom line. You know how many NFLers exit the NFL? I had Ryan Harris on yesterday, former offensive lineman for the Steelers. He played for the Broncos. He played for the Texans. And, and he told me, he says, look, he says, I'm financially sound. In other words, what that tells me is that he was able to manage his money in a very appropriate manner to where when he retires, when he wants to retire, he can retire and not rely on the NFL to continue paying bills when he doesn't want to play anymore. Because those two don't work right. out, and you can end up broke three years or removed from the NFL. So that's also some, some food right. for thought for you as you move forward into the NFL. Look, Troy was a redshirt experience. It was something you took personally yeah. because you recognized the truth 
in that winning wasn't happening. Always a winning mentality, but when you're on a losing team, it's hard to maintain that type of reality and have the same uplifting personality that other people can see. But this was the only time you hadn't been able to play in a game was in that redshirt experience. You were a 6A starter in high school. You were very fluid for over two and a half years, and all of a sudden you come to a system where you weren't playing, you weren't getting the ball, you were on the sidelines. I mean, you had taken your spirituality to another level as you experienced an epiphany knowing God had an alternate plan for your life. And then, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, lo and behold, you had an opportunity to redshirt as a freshman but still not in a winning position as a team overall. What was it about the frustration which occurred as you were still not named a starter in your freshman year? Um, it was it was tough. Like you said, my red shirt freshman year, you know, I went there, went there in the summer. Um, all the freshmen and everything got in. And two running backs came in to that class. We had um, Brandon Burks. He was my roommate. He ended up being my roommate for four years. He's also with the New York Jets right now. I love him to death. Talk to him every day. He's like a brother. And um, they had me. So both of us went in doing a song. Both of us worked hard. And, but he was he was a little bit more bigger than I was. Brandon, he was like he came in like 185, close to like 190. And I was and I came in 165, 170. So both of us got red shirted. Both of us got red shirted, but um, they they let him dress out. And like I wasn't dressing out, and they had him on kickoff returns, and I wasn't um, doing none of that. And um, but I was traveling into the game and stuff. I just had my jersey on the sideline, and you know, like we had a seat, we had three, we had three seniors in front of us, and they really wasn't, you know, they really wasn't effective in like the running game, you know, because like some of the runners they had five or six yards, and we were like, can you do it in this? We would have had 2012. And, you know, like we're questioning, like, some of the coaches' play calling and some of the coaches' decisions. And, you know, after week four, week five, we looking at two and three. And then week nine, we about three and six. And so we, we're losing. And I'm like, like, what, like, what's going on? I know I'm better than who y'all got in. Like, what's going on? So, um, me and my mom, we have a close relationship, and she have a close relationship with God. So she, like, me and her used to talk every day about it. It was time I used to, after practice, I used to go in my dorm room and cry, you know, because I'm like, dang, I'm not doing this. Like you said, I was a, I was a two, two year and a half starter in high school, and I'm coming here. You know, it, it just taught me patience. It just taught me to be patient. So, um... After talking with my mom and everything, she's like, uh, just be patient. I got a plan for you. Just be ready when your time comes. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. But still, I'm uh, like, I know I'm better. I know I can do this. I know I can do that. And she's like, just be patient. It's not your time yet. So I'm like, okay, all right. So um, that season went by, and my red shirt freshman year came came up, and we still was a running back by committee. Uh, we, had, we rotated that year. We rotated five backs. So me... And four more other running backs. Um, I really didn't get the playing time that I thought I was supposed to get then either. And that year that went by, we wasn't we wasn't all that good. Like we finished that year four and seven. And you know, like when you're losing, it, it's hard to stay focused. You know, it, it's hard to stay focused when you're losing stuff not going your way. So um, my red shirt, my red shirt sophomore year came by. We still was a running back by committee. We rotated four backs this year. And um, I didn't, I think I, I saw one start. I saw one start my very first sophomore year. And that's when um, we played Georgia. We played Georgia that year. And man, Georgia put a whooping on us 66 to 0. Like I never lost that bad in the game. Never. So um, that was another losing season. And so I, I just told myself, I said, like, no matter what, what happened, no matter what goes on, I'm going to be the starter this year. That's what I told myself after my red shirt sophomore year. So um, heading into my red shirt junior year, I was working hard, like all through summer workouts. I stayed late. I caught tennis balls. I was working out on Saturdays, doing a little stuff on Sundays. And I was just saying to myself, like, I'm about to put myself in the best position. I know I'm going to be the best. Um, I 
I'm going to be the best running back on my team. I'm going to be the best running back in the Sun Belt. I'm going to be the best running back in the nation. And like, that's why I used to tell myself every day. And that was, that's what I was working for. So um, heading to fall camp after the, after uh, summer workouts, the, the depth chart came out. And I was named the starter. And so the first day of fall camp, um, it was a no contact drill. We was going through seven on seven. And I took a, a, a hit, me and uh, DB, I took an out route and I was turning up field and me and him collided knee to knee. And I tore my ACL, like, right, right when I was working so hard, right when they announced the stars, like, I tore my ACL and I, and I was out for the season. And like that, that season there, it, it, it was really, really a wake up call, you know? Like, I was, I was questioning God. I'm like, God, like, why are you letting this happen to me? You know, like, what's going on? I just want to start a position. Now I'm out for the season. And thank God, I was healthy all throughout my football career. And this injury that I suffered, it was my first major injury. I tore my ACL, my LCL, and my meniscus. So I, I didn't know what to do. Like, I was, I was depressed. For about a month, I was depressed about a month, but I still was working hard in my uh, physical therapy, and I was just like, like mom, like, like what's going on? Like why God allowed this to happen to me? Like my college career not supposed to be like this, and she she, she still said, well, God got a plan for you. God got a plan for you. Just just stay faithful, stay humble, keep working hard, and all of that like that. And I ended up working hard. Um, I got cleared. Uh, probably like three and a half months, three and a half months early. And Dr. Dugas, he was like, Asian Peterson, uh, he was like, I, I, I got cleared faster than Asian Peterson got cleared. He, he was like, he don't know how, how, how I did it. He don't know what went on, but he was like, I got cleared like real fast. And, um, I went through spring training with Troy. Went through spring training, went through um, the spring, no contact. Went through summer workouts and everything. I ended up graduating with my bachelor's in um, criminal justice from Georgia University. And then I was just thinking to myself, I was like, I'm heading to my senior year. Um, I need to put up some good numbers. I need to be the starter. You know, I'm like, I, I need to be the starter. That's what I was telling myself like every day when I was thinking about it. And um, I had talks with my mom about transferring, and she was like, no, no, you're not transferring. You need to stay right where you're at. You need to stay where you're at. You've been there this long. Like, no, you, you're not transferring. So I'm like, mom, like, they just brought in two running backs. You know, like, we got another running back coming back. I'm like, mom, I don't think they're going to stop me. Like, I said, I'm coming off this knee injury. I don't think they trust it, mom. I don't think they trust me. Like, I'm like, mom, I need to transfer. So she was like, no, no, you're not transferring. So, I went behind her back, and um, I had talks with Georgia State. I had talks with South Alabama, um, Jacksonville State, and I also had talks with Alabama State. So once I went over to Coach Brown, like I love Coach Brown, like he's my dad. I, I love Coach Brown like to death. And um, I went over and talked to him and told him that you know I had thoughts about transferring, and he was telling me like, no, nah, no, nah, you good, just just think about it, and uh, just come back and talk to me. So I went back. It took me like two weeks to get my release. So I ended up getting my release, and on my release, he had every Sun Belt school blocked. So that took that took away Georgia State, and that took away South Alabama. So um, that left Jacksonville State and Alabama State. And I thought about my boys. I thought about my kids, and um, I didn't want to go too far away from them. And Jacksonville State is like three and a half hours away from Montgomery, so. I, I didn't go there, so I ended up transferring to Alabama State, and that's when I went there. I really, really had a good um, career there. Had a good, a good year. I played seven games. I played seven games at Alabama State because I missed um, four games with a high display. Had a high suffered a high display in the second game there. Um, I came up strong in the second quarter of the season. Uh, finished strong. Um, got an invite. The FCS National Bowl game did pretty good there. Talked to several scouts, and also got another invite to the um, Tropical Bowl, and I did really well there. Um, talked to more scouts there, and it's basically my college experience. 
<laughs> well, you know, your college experience, you certainly start somewhere. Let's kind of t take a step back here for half a minute. Why? Because when, when you look at the types of coaching changes that occur, look, change is good. Change can also be very bad, but it's the fear of change that some people have that disables them from being able to recognize their potential, where they can go, how they can get there, and what steps need to be taken in order to get to that ne that next point. So during Troy, while you were there, there were a lot of there were a lot of changes, and coaching change happens to be a part of it. But a new coaching staff means that you have more of a potential, a new opportunity prior to tearing your ACL and your LCL. Uh, along with your with your meniscus, which I'm sure is an absolute horrible experience, I wouldn't want to share that pain with anybody. But but that's something that you had to deal with. You had to contend with. You were on the sideline. The mentality was you know did was was very. It wasn't something you weren't familiar with because again you were on the sidelines that whole time wondering, well, am I going to get a start? Am I going to get a start? And then here you are. You get an opportunity. You bang knees. Here you are with an ACL, LCL, and meniscus tear. But when you what was your response when the doctor cleared you three months earlier? In your mind, did you think that it came full circle and your mindset was that now you can move forward and be very explosive and do the types of things, even a non-contact drill, because footwork is important. I don't care if it's a non-contact or not. If you're out there, then you're jumping the sticks, you're moving, you're, you're trying to cut, you're trying to slide and things of that nature. What were you ready to do mentally that you were able to interpret that on a physical level once you got onto the field? Yeah, um, when he told me I was cleared, like, the thing I did, I, I called my mom, I was like, hey, mom, Dr. Dooley said I was cleared, and then she was like, okay, he said that, but well, is your knee really ready? Like, I'm like, yeah, mom, yeah, mom, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm telling you, I'm good. And then she was like, but it, it, are you mentally ready? And then I'm, I started thinking, <laughs> when she asked me that, I'm like, dang, like, I won't be, am I going to be scared to make a cut? Am I going to be scared to do this? And it took me, I say it took me like two months to make a cut from, cause I, I did it, I did it on my left knee. It took me like two months to make a cut without hesitating from the going from the right, I mean from the left to the right. Like I was, I was perfect from going right to left, but I was thinking like, I didn't think I was thinking about it, but I really was. And like, you can see it on film, like going through spring, when I went through spring with Troy, uh, you can you can kind of see it like I was, I wasn't, you know, I I, I kind of lost that first, and then I just kept working on it, working on it, working on it, working on it with um, my strength and conditioning coach, Coach Horton. Uh, he's Troy's strength and conditioning coach, great man, great man. He he's, he's probably eighty percent of the um, success that Troy had in the last season. He's about eighty percent of the reason that um, they had that success. But yeah, I had. Um, I was, I, my mind, I was mentally scared and weak about it, but, you know, I was physically, I was physically strong, strong, but I was mentally weak for like two months. And uh, just hearing him, he, you know, he just hearing Coach Hoyle in my ear saying, it's not, it, it's fixed, it's fixed. Like, you go, like, cut on it. Don't be scared, cut on it. It's fixed, it's fixed. And I just, I was just kept applying that in my head. Like, two months later, I, I was good. I wasn't thinking about it anymore. That was good. You know, transferring to Alabama State was probably the best thing that could have happened to you because that enabled you to do a myriad of things. You were closer to family. You were able to visit with with your sons uh, and be with your sons and spend time with them, very quality time. And as a dad, that's that's a very critical component. Uh, and and it, 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 not not every father has that ability uh, in order to be able to spend that time. So being home there certainly was something that you realized was the most important to you, which meant probably more than anything to you, which again helps you go on a day in day out basis, knowing what level you need to attain. And that's the NFL level and actually staying in the NFL and make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, GMs, scouts, coaches. I know you've already visited with, with, with Mark. Well, back with, but look, this guy is a solid character. He has his degree, so his intelligence factor is their football IQ is high. He's completely healed and beyond that tear, but he understands the struggles and the ramifications of going through what he went through to take him where he's headed to now, and that's a New Orleans Combine coming this weekend. And look, he's a versatile back. He can catch anything. He can do it out of the backfield. He can do it in the flat Wherever you need him at, he will be. He's very versatile. He can do punt returns. This guy is a a hidden weapon. 
he's a hidden tool that if you sleep on him, somebody else is going to grab him, and then you're going to probably shake your and say, I, can't, I cannot believe that we've gone through this entire draft and even grabbed him out at of at being, you know, uh, an undrafted, you know, free agent. This guy is solid. Don't sleep on this guy. You look at all of his, look at his stats, 2016, had two rushing touchdowns. He had two total touchdowns, a total of 12 points. But but what makes it more interesting is that, look, in the NFL, and I've said it before on the show, and I'll say it again, that the NFL should be more concerned with acquiring character, talent. Too often than not, you get guys in the news, which is bad news, and I don't mean good news, bad news, because bad news is talked about first, good news, always second. That's my new model here on the Root Dog Show. Right. Look, tune in. This is this is live. I'm on Facebook Live. Download the app on Google and iTunes, and make sure that you you tune in, because this is a very impactful show. I'll also have Ben Quigley of Celebrity Squared coming up shortly. We'll discuss the lineage here at 45 after. Uh, but look, uh, this guy doesn't fail drug tests. It's not something that he's a part of. He doesn't get involved in the uh, gang a- activities. He's clean. He's clear. He's ready to rock and roll at a moment's notice. He has a smoke or drink or anything else. Why? Because he need, he understands that his character, his ability to be a role model to his kids is first and foremost, and that is non-equivocal. You cannot put anything in front of that. It's very valid. I think NFL teams sleep on these types of guys way too often. It happens way too much, and it needs to be resolved, and certainly Mark Beckwith is certainly a guy that can get it done, that can show you what he can do, not only on the field, off the field, but in the locker room. He's an all-around great player. He's a solid athlete, and I love talking to you today, Mark Thanks, man. I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me. Hey, no, it's it's not a problem at all. Look, I, I want to talk about some of the volunteering things that, that 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 you've been a part of, and then we're talking about giving back to the community, giving back to certain areas, and then and then uh, we'll wait for her Ben Quigley to to call in. Uh, when we're talking about volunteering, a lot of NFL teams will look towards guys to say, "Look, what is more near and dear to your heart? Is it uh, the Ronald McDonald houses?" Is it uh, you know giving back to kids in, in in cancer units by visiting them on on Christmas or reading to them during Christmas or just going there to, to read in general to, to give back to to those who cannot help themselves who are in a very dire situation? Of course, you wanted to assess the elderly aspects in retirement homes. Tell me what it was like to go into this facility. I mean, and and clearly at one moment while you were there, you had to vision yourself. So you know what, I'm going to be here. Eventually, at, at one point in my life, I may end up being here. Did the reality set in that that could happen as you get into your 80s or 90s in a retirement home? Um, I, I really didn't think about that. I just sat there and just embraced the moment. You know, sitting on sitting there with those elderly people, just seeing like how how blessed I am. Like I was in there with people who lived a long life, and I just I just was asking God just bless me to get half of the age. And it was just a humbling experience. Like, we, we sat there and played bingo with them. You know, we sat there and just talked talk about it. Like, um, I even met a World War II um, soldier. Like, like, he just sat there and was just telling me, like, we talked about 30, 35 minutes. Like, he just told me about his experience when he was in war. Like, it was, like, man, I just, I just loved it. Well, you know, look, it, it's always nice to know that you can give back to to those people that can't really help themselves anymore, and they're there playing bingo, and they're living out their, the, the rest of their life. But at some point, the sense of humility really had to file in to your mind, saying, wow, you know, this is this is where everybody is, is going to, well, not everybody, but a, a good part of people actually do go to, but... When, when it comes to understanding, have a sense of humility, saying, well, I, I want to do this again. Any other things that you've been a part of from a voluntary perspective that you believe um, is more so designed to give back to the young ones? I, I understand you attended some elementary schools for some readings as well. Right. I, I attended um, plenty of elementary schools. Uh, went there went for the Dr. Seuss Cat in the Hat um, you know, that they do every year, went there with those kids and just being a sports figure, you know, like they, they do the big names on TV, like the Cam Newman and the Julio's, like those big names. But I'm, I'm like right here 
in their neighborhood. I'm right there with them. I'm telling them, you know, like in school, I'm telling them, you know, like don't get in trouble. Listen to your parents. Listen to your teachers. Don't do drugs. And just being a positive person to those kids and like that, that was really that was really humble right there because that that really humbled me also because having those little kids and coming in and, and talking to me because I remember when athletes used to come to school and talk to me, you know, and now I'm in that position looking back from 10, 10 years ago, 10, 10, probably 15 years ago when I was in elementary school and athletes came in and talked to me. Now I'm doing it to, to um, elementary kids. Even going to the um, Boys and Girls Club, it is a little good times program, just sitting with the kids, uh, helping them out with their homework, math, doing math problems with them, um, project, help kids do, do their project. And like, I felt like, you know, because I have kids too, and I just felt like I sat there and had a conversation with them. I just felt like they were just one of mine. You know, yeah, just, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You 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 put yourself in that situation. You put your kids in a situation. And you would want them to get a positive influence from somebody such as yourself coming into an elementary school, making the impact that they have. Look, 2016, 208 rushing yards, 5.2 rushing average with two rushing touchdowns. You put a lot of teams on notice, Marquell. Look, ladies and gentlemen, Marquell Beckwith here on the Rude Dog Show. Marquell, hey man, thank you so much. I wish you the best in the combine. Please let me know how that works out for you and uh, what kind of feedback you received from the scouts out there, if you if you could do that for me. Yes, sir, I got you. I got you. <laughs> thanks a lot, Marquell. Hey, thanks, man. Safe travels to you, uh, to Nolens, and uh, we'll talk sooner rather than later. All right, thank you, man. Thanks. Take care. Take care you too. Thank you. Look, ladies and gentlemen, Marquell Beckwith in the 2017 NFL drafted. I almost want to say 2016, but 2017 just sounds like a, a good number. Marquell Beckwith. Look, this guy is a solid running back. He comes from uh, Alabama State University. Look, he recognized the opportunities despite the types of things that were in his way that basically railroaded him to being on the sideline. And as I said before, change is good when you recognize you have to make the change. From, from an academic standpoint, from an athletic standpoint, from a university standpoint, sometimes you have to make those changes because more often than not, you're going to find out that those changes can be proven beneficial versus being a negative, but you don't know what change is until you actually try. And that's all there is to that. Look, I want to give a quick a shout out. I wish my commercials were working. I apologize. Uh, but I do have some great sponsors here. Uh, when you look at sponsors, you look at quality, and I'm looking for more sponsors as well. Uh, next gentleman to join me is Ben Quigley of Celebrity Squared, uh, an up and coming app. It's a, it's a, it's something that's going to engage not only people from all walks of life, but being able to find their best. Well, for lack of a better term, it's going to find the best athletes that they want to interact with. It's a completely interactive game. We're going to talk with with Ben next. When he gives me a call here on the Rude Dog Show, download the app now. Check out Ben. It's on uh, Google. It's on iTunes. But I want to give a shout out to Anthony Gilbert. New Dash Game Dash Plan dot com can change the way athletes look at agents. It's a very keen perspective that people and players need to be aware of. That this is something that must be talked about. It must be discussed. I'm going to have Anthony on in the following week, and we're certainly going to have him on now. Welcome to the Rude Dog Show. Ben Quigley of Celebrity Square. Welcome, Ben. How are you? Hey, Rudy. How are you? I'm doing good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hump day for some and others. Well, it's just uh, Wednesday. But for me, it's always hump it day. Hump Monday, hump yeah, Tuesday, I, hump Wednesday. And then eventually I'll be able to hump on to Friday and there goes the weekend. It's all, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's all a blur at that point. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Quigley, he's a creator. Of Celebrity Square, this thing is is gaining more more power as the day goes on. Ben, I understand that uh, there there's some entities in play right now that could make Celebrity Square something that uh, was heard back from the 1960s and 1970s. Can you tell audience a little bit more about that and the derivative of where Celebrity Squares is now versus where it was back then? That's correct. Uh, so. Yeah, thank you for having me on your show, first off. I'm very excited. First time of many times to come, I'm guessing here. 
And uh, what's what's great is is uh, my family uh, kind of has like a game show ship in its blood. Uh, my grandpa's cousin uh, Bob Quigley uh, created Hollywood Squares back in the uh, uh, '60s through the '90s. That game show was on, which is very popular. And uh, many other game shows, uh, Heater Quigley Productions. And basically, Celebrity Square is a 21st century version of the old Hollywood Squares, where back then they, you know, it was a tic tac toe game and contestants would get on and they would pick a square and the, the uh, celebrity would be asked a question, you know, and this, the, as a contestant, you had to choose if you believed them or not. And if you said, yes, hey, Whoopi, I believe you. And she said, no, I, I've never done anything like that. That's crazy. Well, the other person would get the square. Our game is more of a uh, speed game where we interview celebrities, athletes, musicians, uh, comedians, models, all using video conferencing technology, uh, which is so awesome about technology, kind of like a Skype. And we uh, cut those interviews up into, you know, true, false, multiple choice questions. And that's our content for the game, which our app, Celebrity Squared app, is launching on Apple uh, devices here in a couple weeks. And then for your Android users, uh, late April, early May, it will be available to you. So we're doing a soft launch. And uh, we have some really great athletes that are lined up, uh, some professional athletes, current and uh, and former, uh, NASCAR drivers to MLB players, NFL players, so on. Well, it sounds like a real solid platform. As a matter of fact, everybody will be able to check out the Celebrity Squared page that I added on the RudeDogShow.com to give you kind of a brief outline. There'll be more to come. There'll be a lot more, more buns, a way to interact as well, to download the application and the more you download, the better you'll be and the the, high, the more of an experience that you'll capture when you're in the Celebrity Squared platform. Uh, I, you, you, you sent me the link, Ben, and uh, I had a chance to check it out. I did look at it. Of course, it's, um, you know, it, it, it's on a MacBook, so it's not the best looking. But when you get on a mobile platform, which is basically what, what it's designed to be, everybody's on their phone nowadays. Everybody could probably attest to being on their phone. I'm not on my phone because, well, I'm on the radio, so I can't have my phone in my hand and be on the radio at the same time. Uh, but, Ben, it, you stated it's going to be available for Google users the end of April, early May, correct? That's correct for Android users. So, uh, traditionally, a lot of apps uh, that start out start out on the Apple platform. Uh, it's just kind of uh, just the app world the way it is. And unless you have millions of dollars to create uh, a functional app on both platforms, uh, this is the way we're starting it. And you know, the thing is, is that you know, right now we're going to be uh, adding on more and more people. You know, we have uh, just tons of celebrities now reaching out. One of the biggest components of uh, participating in the Spudgy Square app is that we raise money for charity every time you play a contest. Wow. Sounds like something everybody can certainly uh, download. Look, download the app there. I mean, you want to get involved in the process. You want to contribute to charities. And look, a lot of these, and, and, you know, Ben, me and you have spoken before uh, offline. I've spoken to a lot of athletes. A lot of them do have foundations that they contribute uh, their their money to. Uh, matter of fact, I had Ryan Harris on yesterday, former uh, offensive lineman for the Steelers, and uh, I can certainly contact him as well and see what his thoughts are and what charities he's a part of because everybody has one. If you're on an NFL team, you yeah. must contribute to some type of foundation, Ronald McDonald House, or, or or whatnot. Is this something that everybody can be a part of, or is this Absolutely. just something that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, and that's what's great is, is that it's not limited to a celebrity's charity or foundation of their choice. We're working with many charities that don't have a celebrity attached to them or a celebrity endorser, whether it's an animal shelter to a human rights activist uh, organization and all other walks, you know, different causes, whether it's cancer or related or other things. And what we do is actually we'll, we'll set up a celebrity to endorse them, and the celebrity will participate in the contest and be interviewed by us, and uh, we cut that interview up into true, false, multiple choice questions, and we raise serious money. We have two charities right now that are full done, ready to launch. One's called Rock and Roll for Children out of Washington, D.C., a uh, great cause for inner city kids and stuff like that there, and we have a, um, a rock and roll star that is going to be participating in that, and I'm not saying the names of these people. Why? I want people to download the app with curiosity to find out who these people are. And then uh, uh, we have, um, for Abolish Slavery Now, we have an actor in Hollywood that everyone uh, will, will be very familiar with. Uh, and Abolish Slavery Now is our national charity 
just because uh, one of my investors um, is uh, is the founder of this uh, organization. And you know what's really cool is it's all about human trafficking. They're stopping human trafficking, which we don't realize how big you know, of a problem it really is in the United States and actually around the world. And so they do some really amazing things here in the United States in, in uh, trying to prevent and help the families that have uh, experienced the, you know someone that was stolen and uh, other weird things that go on with that. And they go they go on they go on missions every year over to Africa and literally. Uh, there's kids that are stolen from families on a daily basis in Africa, and they're never they're slaves, and they're on they're on fishing boats and in other areas of mines and stuff like this. And the kids are working as a slave for you know from a very young age. And we're talking some of these kids are eight, nine, ten years old, and uh, they they go and they free these kids off these fishing boats and through these mine uh, areas where these these people are slaves. So that's the bottle of slavery now. There's so many. So if there is anybody that they executive director, a board member of any type of charity, go to celebritysquared.com and uh, just uh, fill out the contact us form and we will we'll, we'll talk to you, get you some more information on the contest, but based on your database, you know, how many users you have, uh, donors, uh, users on social media, how many donors, database emails you have, we're going to help you realistically set a goal uh, that we can help raise money. But the great thing is, is by tying the celebrity to you, uh, they are going to be tweeting and Facebook messaging and, and Snapchatting and Instagramming out, you know, play for this, you know, play Celebrity Square to play this fundraiser. So you get the power as a charity of the celebrities, uh, you know, their likeness. And, you know, obviously we have some really awesome celebrities uh, that have literally millions and millions of followers on social media sites. And, uh, you know, that's what they're, they're all about it. They, they want to help these different charities. And, uh, you know, and promote themselves as well. Let's all be real. And so that's what's great with the athletes as well. Whether they're current or they're, you know, retired now, they still want to be involved. And, you know, the athletes and celebrities, there's a broad stroke, whether it's a musician, comedian, actor, actress, you know, you know they also make money off Celebrity Squared. And any, uh, anybody listening out there that is a, uh, entertainment professional and pro sports are definitely entertainment professionals. Uh, you can, again, go to SluggySquare.com, contact Rudy, and we'll happy, be very happy to explain to you the whole process. I mean, Rudy, what do you think here? If we're giving away a Range Rover and we have an in-app purchase section of the con- of the game, so the app's free uh, to do the fundraiser contest. It's just a simple $10 donation, but we're giving away trips for a week to Disney World for a family of four or Hawaii. We're giving away cars, cash prizes. Uh, there's going to be daily contests where people can play for shopping sprees, whether it's Macy's, Nordstrom, Starbucks, gift cards, and things like that for free. And uh, there's an in-app purchase section where we're going to give away Range Rovers. One of our contests we have coming up, we're giving a, it's a flight for up to eight people, round trip, uh, from wherever they live. They, they live, uh, like let's say that they live in L.A., uh, they can fly up to San Francisco, Las Vegas, or San Diego with eight friends on a G6. Which would normally cost them twenty thousand dollars to do that, but how many people would pay two dollars for a chance to win that with a bunch of their friends? Uh, I think everybody, everybody out there, look, listeners, check it out. Like I said, I have a page on therudogshow.com. Go to celebritysquare.com as well. There's a lot of information there, and there'll be more information provided uh, as time goes on. Certainly, uh, welcome the opportunity to have to have you on the show, Ben. And yeah, yeah, you know what? You mentioned earlier to have you on the show more often. We're certainly going to do that. We want to keep everybody updated as to what's going on with Celebrity Squared. Uh, and if anybody wants to log in, download the application, you can go to the Rude Dog Show. I should have that link up by the end of the week. If you want to be a part of it, you want to win cash prize, you want to be a part of what everybody else will be doing. And I think this is going to be a widespread thing, Ben. Oh, I, I appreciate that so much. And yes, definitely before the launch, the week of uh, the the twenty seventh coming up here, we'll get we'll get back on here and remind people and, and let them know that they can go to the app store and, and download Celebrity Square. Sounds fantastic! Look, Ben Quigley, a creator, owner, the the man with the master plan. Even if it has to do with an app, it's working. Ben Quigley, hey Ben, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate you coming on the show, and uh, we'll talk a lot sooner than later. Yeah, absolutely. Take care. Thanks, man. You too. Thanks, man. Look, ladies and gentlemen, Ben Quickly on the Rude Dog Show talking about this fantastic app, Celebrity Square. And it was very unique to uh, to to talk to Ben in, in regards to this. And I really think there's an opportunity to give back. Look, there are charities all over the world that aren't even being talked about, aren't even being discussed. 
why would you not pay a dollar to win a raffle for eight people on a C6 or some type of Cessna in order to take a vacation somewhere? I mean, it's it's un, it's unheard of. It's unparalleled. I don't even know what any app that I've ever seen, and I and I, I enjoy the apps. I'll be honest with you. I look at apps. I look at what they're about. I look at the foundation. When you look at the information on this app, and it'll be mainstream coming by the end of March, as Ben had indicated. You got to You got to You got to check it out. You got, You have to check it out. There's no doubt about it. Um, I, I don't have an Apple phone, unfortunately. I don't really deal with with fruit. Uh, I do have an Android. I guess I'm gonna have to wait then. It's unfortunate I have to wait there. But when I wait, it's gonna be at the end of the tunnel. It'll be well worth the wait, no doubt about it. Uh, but look, everybody, thank you for tuning in. I will be on tomorrow with some more fantastic talent here on the Root Dog Show. So download the app. It's on Google. It's on iTunes. This is Rudy Reyes on the Root Dog Show on WBLCSports.com.